broadcast of Calvary Compassion Church. You're listening to Pastor Teddy Sanders. Let's join him as he teaches verse by verse from the Word of God. For those of you who are visiting, I am really, that's this crazy. Um, you know, we, we believe in having a good time in the Lord. You know, so once again, thank you all for being here. Thank everybody for being here. But if you are a first or second time guest, thank you so much for being here and worshiping with us uh, on this morning. One thing that we do, take out your Bibles. Amen. Amen. If you don't have a Bible, look up under the chair or the chair in front of you. If you don't own a Bible, you can take one of those Bibles and make it your own. If you have more than one of our Bibles at your house, please do bring it back. <laughs> they, they are expensive, but, you know, um, we don't want to, uh, you know, charge it to the account of God if you have more than one. And turn over to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. For those of you who are visiting maybe for the first or the second time, uh, we teach systematically through the Bible here. So uh, you are actually here on a good Sunday. We actually started the book of Ephesians uh, two weeks ago. Uh, and so we're going to pick it up in chapter 1. And I think I, last time I got to what, verse 5 or 6? Who said 5? That's a good Bible student right there. Everybody here say amen. amen. You know, a, a lot of times, you know, we, we take for granted the things that the Lord has blessed us with. And, you know, I, I'm talking on a level of a, an individual, but, you know, also as it relates to the church. And, you know, I, I, I had the, uh, the opportunity, I had to, to uh, perform a, a funeral yesterday morning down in West Palm. And, you know, people are really hungry for the word of God. And, and you know, to be taught systematically. And, and, you know, just the, the response, you know, and I, I, I taught yesterday from uh, Mark chapter 4, you know, where Jesus calms the storm and, you know, just really taught through those, those few verses of scripture. And, and, you know, people were very hungry just for the, the word of God, you know, not, not my opinion or, or, you know, a good story. You know, all those things are important, but, you know, the word of God stands alone. Amen. And that's what's going to make the difference in our lives. It, it's the word of God because, you know what, eventually I'm going to let you down. You know what, I'm, I'm going to let you down at some point in time. You know, so let me go ahead and apologize for that now. Uh, but God will never, ever let you down, nor will he'll ever fail you. And the more of God's word that we have, the better off we're going to be. Because he said he exalted his word even above his name. And, and you know, I, I, I can't begin to just encourage you all to get into the word on your own, not just on Sunday mornings. But you know what, just like I'm hungry right now, I'm gonna eat as soon as the church over with, right? And I'm gonna eat tomorrow and the next day and the next day, multiple times a day. That's the same thing we need to do with the word of God. We need to feed our spiritual man or our spiritual souls, amen? All right, let's pray. Father, we do thank you that we can come together as the body of Christ, Lord. And Father, if we have offered up to you songs of praise and songs of worship, Lord. We ask that it was pleasing to your sight, Lord God. Father, now we ask that you clear our hearts and our minds and Lord heal us of those hunger pains right now, God. And Father, just help our focus to be upon you now. Lord, as we look into your word, we know that you still do speak. We know that you speak most often through your word. But Lord, we know that you also give special revelation uh, to us pertaining to where we are. So meet us exactly where we are, Father. And Lord, we give you all the praise, all the honor, because all the glory belongs to you. And all those who agree, say amen. amen. Hey, but before, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But before, you know what, before I get into the word, I, Jamila, I ain't going to let you out praise me regarding my wife. <laughs> You, you know, uh, my, my, my wife, for those of you who don't know, this, this, is, this is my wife right here, this lovely lady right here. And, and she is indeed an awesome woman. Yeah. She is. She is my, my, my backbone. You know what? Behind every good man, there is a greater woman. So, you know, baby, I love you. I, I thank God for you. She drives me everywhere I go. She's supportive. She gets on my nerves. Um, you know what? But, but, I, but I love her so and you know what? She, she is, Jamila. She is, and she's, she's an awesome, 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 awesome woman. And Sister Cheryl, Sister Cheryl, I get on me all the time about my wife. But you know what? My wife gives me great sermon material. 
she, she does. And, you know, I, I can't make this stuff up. But, you know, the, despite the different things you hear, hear, she and I say, you know, because right now, once again, we're empty nesters. You know, the, the kids, Ethan is gone. Diana is leaving here soon. And so we were over the sink yesterday, and I'm like, girl, we really got to like each other, huh? And, you know, we got to start all over again. But she is an awesome, awesome woman. And what you see is what you get. She is like this 24-7. 24-7. Everywhere you see her or hear her. <laughs> Never have a problem finding my wife. <laughs> Just stop this. All right, Sister Cheryl, I'm going to leave alone. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 1, and I'm going to... Since I stopped at about verse 5, I'm just going to read through those verses, and then we'll pick it up where I left off. Amen? It says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, remember... What you're going to see here is you're going to see Paul. Remember, this is probably the, the longest uh, uh, sentence in the Greek manuscript. Because what happens is, you know, Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he's, he's writing this. And he just got so excited about the things that God has done and will do and continue to do for the believers. And so once again, just remember, verses 4 through 6 are the blessings of God the Father. Right? And then I'm going to break it down as we, we go from this point. So, verse 4, just as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he has made us accepted and to beloved. Now, once again, if you missed the, 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 the teaching on uh, when I started the book of Ephesians, know that we are, we are chosen. You know, no one brings anything to the table. God in his infinite love and wisdom has predestined us to be children of God. Now, as, as it relates to, to the non-believers, you know, when we're sharing our faith, we don't go up to them and say, hey, you know that you were chosen or you was not chosen. Once again, God does not condemn anybody to hell. That's a personal decision. You know, when it talks about blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, that is never receiving Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And so that, that decision that you made in the hardening of your heart is yours and not his. Now, here's the thing. Once again, I don't know how all of that works. I believe that there's the, you know, that we are elected or we're chosen. I believe that man has a responsibility as well. And I don't know how it works. But you know what? Here, here's what I do know. Wherever I come across it in the Bible, it's not my personal agenda. That's how I teach it. So here it says that we are chosen. I believe that we're chosen and that we're elected. Okay? Let's not, I ain't going to go too deep because I'm not that kind of guy. I'm not that deep of a guy. But just know that, hey, I do believe that the Bible teaches that we were chosen and that we were elected and predestined. And I also believe that the Bible teaches that man has a responsibility. Okay? Amen. Let's try it again. Amen. You know, y'all know me, right? Y'all know I can't see six feet in front of me. Right? So I told the church yesterday, I'm like, hey. The only way that I know that you all are here, if I say something that resonates with your soul, you respond with the amen. amen. Now, that wasn't your cue. Come on now. Come, come on. Okay. When I say something that resonates with your soul, you all are to say amen. God is good. Amen. Okay. All right. That lets me know that y'all still there. Now, verses 7 through 12. Let's look at that. Now here, these are the blessings of God the Son, Jesus Christ. It says, in him we have redemption, underline redemption, through his blood, the forgiveness of sin, underline forgiveness of sin, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Everybody say with me, we are redeemed. We are redeemed. To redeem a person means paying a price sometimes called a ransom. It means buying that person's freedom. We have been redeemed by Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, verses 23 and 24. Romans chapter 3, verses 23 and 24. It says, For all have sinned 
and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. Y'all all know my saying, right? I'm jacked up. All of us are jacked up. We have been redeemed in Jesus Christ by the blood that was shed on the cross for us. We were deserving of death, but God in his infinite love and wisdom sent his son to, to die on the cross for us and for all of our sins. 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 through 19. It says, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot, we are redeemed. With that redemption, we also receive forgiveness of sins. That should make you shout by itself. Because there is nothing, Damien, that you can do that if you won't ask the Lord to forgive you, that he will not forgive you for. Regardless of what it is that you, ha you have done. And a lot of times we are our biggest critic. You know what? When God has forgiven us for something, we continue to, to, you know, roll over in the mud in that situation or whatever that thing is over and over again. And God's like, well, what are you doing now? Now, I've forgiven you for that. You, you've asked for forgiveness and therefore I have forgiven you. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give you all a whole bunch of scriptures that deals with how the Lord has forgiven us and how he, he views us. All right. Here we go. Romans chapter six, verse 23 states this first. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Remember, we are somebody in Christ Jesus. You are something to reckon with. Ray, you are something to reckon with in Christ Jesus. Now, Ray, outside of Christ Jesus, you might be a good guy. And I believe you to be a good guy, Ray. But in God's economy, that don't cut it. So... Everything that we do has to be in Christ Jesus. Psalms 103, verse 12. Psalms 103, verse 12. It says, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Can anybody tell me how far the east is from the west? What's the distance? Huh? You mean we don't know? Well, according to the scripture... It says, as far as the east is from the west, that's how he forgives us when we confess our sins to him. Amen? You know, my son, Ethan, everybody knows Ethan is a character. Ethan has never caused me any problems until he got to age 18. But when Ethan was probably about five or six, Ethan was over to a friend's house and he stole a toy. And, and of course, you know, that, that set me off. And I wanted to do some things to him. And, but, but at the time, I realized that when I, when I discipline, I don't discipline because I'm upset. You discipline to correct the behavior. And so I began to pray and ask the Lord, well, Lord, how do you want me to handle this situation? And God says, I want you to go to the toy store. I want you to buy him a toy. I'm like, what? <laughs> what? What do you mean you want me to go to the toy store and buy him a toy? God, he just stole from his friend. And Lord, still, and according to your word, is wrong. And what do you mean you want me to go buy him a toy? And God said this to me, and I never forget it. He says, I have, I've given you a free gift. And so you're going to teach him about me by, although he deserves judgment and punishment, you're going to go and you're going to give him a free gift. And you're going to love him. And then you're going to explain to him what salvation is and how it works. And I'm like, what? <laughs> well, but what do I do about the behavior? He says, love is going to correct it. And you all know what? Ethan never stole anything else that I'm aware of <laughs> ever again. But you know what? That's how God deals with us in the forgiving of sin. You know, we, 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 we sin and therefore we are, should be judged according to that sin. But because of the work that Jesus Christ has done on the cross for us, we have received that free gift of forgiveness. There's nothing that we can do to earn it. 
And God doesn't love you any more now than the day when he died for you. He loves you because he loves you. And there's nothing that we can do to make him love us more, and there's nothing that we can do to make him love us any less. God loves us, and that's Bible. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. It says, come now, and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Micah chapter 7, verse 19. <coughs> Excuse me, Micah chapter 7, verse 19. It says, he will again have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquities. You will cast all your sin into the depths of the sea. So, he says, he forgive our sins as far as these is from the west, right? So we don't know how far that is. We can't measure it. This, this, this is mind blowing. We can put a man on the moon. We've done it, right? But do you all know we don't know how deep the ocean is? Does anybody know how deep the ocean is? No, we don't know. And so once again, he depicts a picture to saying, hey, that's how I remember your sins. You know, I won't remember them anymore. As deep as the sea is. 1 John 1.9. 1 John 1.9. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, because of the redemptive work of Jesus Christ, wherever we sin against God, the Holy Spirit comes and it convicts, he convicts us of our sin. And then we have a choice to make. We can go boldly before the throne and we can confess our sins regardless of what it is. Listen, there is nothing that you can do that if you do not ask for forgiveness, God will forgive you. He'll forgive you. So, and, and you know what? He even says this. He says, when our heart condemns us, he, he's even greater than our hearts. Because I'm, a, I'm my worst critic. You know, I, I ask the Lord to forgive me of things, and the enemy comes back and, you know, whispers things, you know, that, that happened years and years ago. And I'm like, wait a minute. Wait a minute, devil. I, I'm forgiven of that. Why are you coming with that? Well, you, well you, you're no good, and you're, not, well, you're partially right. I am no good. My righteousness is a filthy rat before the Lord. But you know what? I'm somebody in Christ Jesus, according to Ephesians chapter 1. I'm somebody. I'm something to be reckoned with. And we have to realize that, that who we are in Christ Jesus, what's available to us in Christ Jesus. And that's the key. Remember, it's in Christ Jesus, not of yourself. It's in Christ Jesus. Verse 9, Ephesians chapter 1. It says, having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. Verse 10 that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ. You guys see that pattern in Christ? Both which are in heaven and which are on the earth. Now, at the end of this world's history, God will gather the believers together in the millennial kingdom. You guys remember that from Revelations? Those of you who are here when we went through the Revelations? Now, this is called the dispensation of the fullness of times, meaning the completion of history. You could go back and look at Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 6, and 21, verse 1. Revelation 20, verses 1 through 6, and Revelation 21, verse 1. Now, Colossians says this, Colossians chapter 1, verses 19 through 20. It said, For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on the earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. As we look at what's not only going on in our country, but what's going on around the world, it seems as if God has lost total control. Now, what you have to understand is that Satan is the prince of the power of the air. The Bible says that Satan is the ruler of this world currently. Now, sure, everything under the sovereignty of God is allowed to happen because of what sin has done to the world. And you know what? There that, that, that just times when I'm like, God, have you forgotten about us? And the answer, of course, is no, he has not. 
And so just know that as these type of things continue to happen, remember last week I told you, we, we were talking about how fast it was happening. Now it's almost, right now it's every week, right? Those birth pangs, Pastor Corey mentioned, those birth pangs are increasing. They're getting faster and faster, all in preparation for his return. And that's the hope that we have. Our hope is not in who's going to be the next president. Our hope is not in how well the economy does or how well it does not do. Our hope is in Christ Jesus. And I can tell folks who have no hope because they, don't, they lose their mind. And you see it. You see it all over social media. You see it in the media. Folks who have lost their mind. You know what? Yes, does it break my heart when I see those type of things happen? It surely does. But you know what? My hope is in Christ Jesus and that he's going to come back for his church. And he's coming back soon, y'all. All right, my Kathy. Can't see you, but I know your voice. <laughs> Hallelujah. And you know what? Folks, hold on to that hope. Whatever you're going through, hold on to that hope. That's the anchor. And that God is who he says he is and that he's going to return for us. Amen? Amen. 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 Verse 11. It says, in him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined, there's that word again, according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Verse 12, that we who first turned in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. Jesus is the source of our inheritance. Jesus is the source of our inheritance. Second Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1. Verses three through four. It says, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by by glory and virtue, by which we have been given to us an exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And so what he's saying here is that, you know, Jesus is, is, is our inheritance. You know, a, a lot of times, you know, people receive an inheritance, you know, when a relative or whoever it may be leaves something for them. But we have an inheritance in Christ Jesus. You know what? And, and that we, we've been redeemed and that we're going to be able to collect. It's going to be fulfilled. The word of God is going to be fulfilled. And a lot of times what happens is we base our relationship off of things that we currently see or things that we currently do not have. And, and, and it's, not, it's not about that. You know, and I don't know if I told you this. I was blessed with a, did I tell you all that I was blessed with a big screen television? Yes, yes, God is good. God is good. I was blessed with a big screen television, right? And so, um, I got it all set up. Pastor Corey came and set it up for me. And, and so I'm trying to access the browser. Jimmy, I'm trying to access the browser. Come to find out, television doesn't come with a browser, right? And I'm like, man, I need a TV with a browser. <laughs> uh, Jimmy, I was blessed with a 60-inch LED TV, smart TV. Hadn't, hadn't been used. Right? Because yeah, y'all remember, I was, I was asking the Lord to always give me a big screen TV. Well, he, he provided it. And then I'm upset because I can't access the browser. <laughs> and it's something. Um, exactly. He gave me what I asked for. And so I had to repent. I repented because I was complaining. Complaining is a sin. And I was complaining against something that he blessed me with. But what happens is, you know what? That wasn't good enough. And it's not. Because it's not about the things that we can receive here on earth. It's about the, the spiritual. It's about my inheritance in Christ Jesus. That's the only thing that is going to fulfill every need that I have. Amen. So don't get caught up in, in the physical things. It's about our inheritance in Christ Jesus. Verse 13 through 14. Let's look at those. Now verses 13 and 14 deals with the blessings from God the Holy Spirit. So we, we, we saw the blessings from God the Father, we saw the blessings from God the Son, and now we're going to see the blessings from God the Holy Spirit. Verse 13, it says, In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed, underline that word, sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Let's first look at it. It says, We trusted after we what? Heard the word of truth. You don't trust after you hear a great story. 
You don't trust after hearing something make you, make you feel good. Because there's going to be some things that I'm going to say on Sunday mornings that's not going to make us feel good. We need truth. And the truth comes from no other than the word of God. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing and what? And hearing the word of God. And hearing the word of God. Hey, listen, if you are visiting and you're looking for a home church, I'm not saying that you have to come here. But if you've been a part of a church that doesn't teach the word of God, probably not the best place for you. You need to belong to a church that teaches the word of God. Amen. Amen. And then it says that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm going to give you three points that relates to sealing. But before I do, I have to give you uh, just a little background. Back when Paul wrote this, sealing was something that, that meant that, that it was authentic. So what would take place, let's say that that was a document. Remember, they didn't have letters like we have traditional letters. Everything was written on scrolls, right? So what they would do is after the scroll was, was rolled up, they would take wax, right? And they would take wax and they would put it on the document and then the, the, the author of that letter had a signet ring. And what he would do with that signet ring is that the signet ring had a symbol on it that would allow people to know who it was from. And so what he would do is he would take that signet ring and press it down into the wax and therefore it was sealed, right? That made it authentic. And that's what the Holy Spirit has done with us. Now, number one, write this down. Sealing implies ownership. Sealing implies ownership. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 through 20. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 through 20. It says, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own, for you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So once again, as a believer, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit, which represents ownership. We now belong to God. We are children of God. Number two, sealing implies authenticity. Sealing implies authenticity. Just as a signature on a letter attests to the genuineness of the document. So the seal of the Holy Spirit also represents authenticity. Romans chapter 8, verse 9. Romans chapter 8, verse 9. It says, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. So as a way of authenticity, what happens? At the moment you profess that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit comes to reside inside of you, right? So now you become the temple of God, the temple of the Holy Spirit. So we get a piece of God that comes to live within us. Remember I said that we bring nothing to the table? God sends his son into the world, right? in human fashion. He lives a sinless life. He is falsely accused. He's beaten. He's spat upon. He's punched. He's bleeding, beaten with the flagellum. He is put on a cross. He dies. After three days, he, he is, he's raised from the dead. And then something miraculous happened. Remember in Acts, we just finished the book of Acts, right? Remember he says that you shall receive power from on high when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, right? And so as a believer, God says, hey, I know what you need. He says, and this lifestyle that I want you to live, you can't live it on your own. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a piece of me to come and reside in you to help you live the lifestyle that I want you to live. The same power that Jesus Christ had, the same power that rested upon and in Jesus Christ, the same power that raised them from the dead, guess what? It's the same power that is within us. See, you have to realize who you are in Christ Jesus. Think about that. You have the spirit of the living God that resides in you. Now, what happens is 
sometimes we don't let people know that. And when I say we don't let people know that, I'm not just talking about witnessing with your mouth, I'm talking about living righteously. Now, I'll be the first to tell you that I'm not a perfect man. Right, baby? Right. <laughs> what you gonna say about that, Sister Cheryl? <laughs> I am not a perfect man, but I'm being perfected. But I can tell you this, I am a consistent man, right, baby? Right. I am a consistent man and living a lifestyle that is pleasing to God. So nobody's going to be perfect. You know, sanctification is a process. And we will never be like Christ until we, we get to heaven. And then we receive our glorified bodies. And so the, the deal is to be consistent in, in who you are in Christ Jesus. Consistency is, is what we're looking for. Number three, sealing also implies security. Security. Our salvation is secure. You cannot lose your salvation once you have made a profession of faith in Jesus Christ and you meant it. Now, there are individuals that do make a profession of faith in Christ. And here's the, and here's the difference. They never change. They never change, right? But once you make that profession in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, there should be some changes. You should not be that person that you were. You should be steadily growing in your faith. Now, what happens is a lot of times, and I'm sure, let's do this. How many people in here think you where you need to be spiritually? Raise your hand. Wait a minute, let me put my glasses on. <laughs> I don't need afraid nobody raise a hand. Oh, we leave the glasses down, right? None of us ever think, you know, we think we should be further along than we actually are, which is a trick of the enemy, right? Because what happens is, what you do is you create this standard, right? But the standard is Christ Jesus. And once again, he's already done the work for us, right? You're as holy as you're going to ever be. You're as holy as you're going to ever be. Remember, once you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, the Spirit of God comes to live in you. That's as holy as you're going to ever be. Now, what happens is, as we live righteously, we live according to the standard of God. So now, what we used to do that was sin... We don't want to do those things anymore, right? And we want to honor the Lord by living according to the word of God. And once again, remember, you bring nothing to the table. And so he know that you can't live according to his word. So it's the spirit of God that helps us to live according to the word of God. You bring nothing to the table. And then what happens is we beat ourselves up. But when you go back and you look at all of the men and the women of the Bible, there was no perfect person. The only perfect person in the history of the world, according to the Bible, was Jesus Christ. And that's the standard. And when we look to the standard, the Bible tells us, I just read the scripture, we all fall short of the glory of God. Now, that's not a license to sin, because Paul writes in Romans, he said, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. So then, what shall I do? Shall I continue to sin because grace abounds more? And then he says what? Certainly not. Certainly not. If you are a Christian, you should be growing in your faith. Sanctification, once again, is a process. Just a fancy word of saying that, you know what? You're becoming more and more like Christ. And you know the truth. You know the truth. You know, you don't look like the person you did six months ago. Or you shouldn't. All of us should be moving forward in our faith. There's no such thing as a standstill Christian. Amen? Our salvation is secure. John chapter 6, verse 37. John chapter 6, verse 37. It says, all that the Father has given me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. Then he goes on to say in John chapter 10, verse 27 and 30. This is Jesus speaking, by the way. He says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone, what? Snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. I and my father are one. We don't serve a schizophrenic God. You know that scripture when, you know, it talks about those individuals. He said, in the last day, those are going to say, Lord, didn't we do this in your name? Didn't we cast out demons? And didn't we do such and such? And then Jesus replies, hey, depart from me. He says, what? I never knew you. He doesn't say, I knew you once. He says, I never knew you. 
not that I knew you and you fell, fell away and now I don't know you anymore. No, he says, I never knew you. So as believers, when we make that, 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 that profession of faith and we mean it and we begin to change, begin to look more and more like Christ Jesus, hey, nobody, nobody. He says, no one can snatch you out of my hand. So with the seal of the Holy Spirit, our salvation is also secure. Verse 14, Ephesians chapter 1. It says, who, once again, I tell you, the greatest commentary on the Bible is what? The Bible. The Bible. Now, talk about our security being uh, secure in Christ Jesus by being sealed. Then he goes on to say, verse 14, it says, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of, the, of his glory? Once again, he said, he said, not only am I going to seal you, he says, but I'm going to guarantee it. Now, that word guarantee can be translated as a pledge or deposit or earnest, right? That word was used in ancient times to describe an engagement ring. Ladies, what's the new thing? Put a ring on it, right? Well, that's what the Lord has done with us. He's put a ring on it. It's called the church, right? That's why he says that the church is what? The bride of Christ, because he has guaranteed it. He has put a ring on it. Second Corinthians chapter one, verse 20. Second Corinthians chapter one, verse 20. And I'm going to read through verse 22. It says, for all the promises of God in him are what? Yes. And in him, what? Amen. To the glory of God through us. Now, he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God who also has sealed us and given us the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. First Peter chapter one. First Peter chapter one, verses three through four. First Peter chapter one, verses three through four. It says, praise be to the God and father, our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And unto and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. Now, this inheritance, being sealed with the Holy Spirit, is only a down payment for what we're actually going to get. When we get to heaven, right? Remember, we're going to be just as Jesus. So what happens right now, the Bible says that when we die, to be absent from the body is to what? To be present with God, right? And so what happens is, you know, we get to go to heaven, and that's great. We get to, 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 to be with Jesus. But what's going to happen at the rapture is that God is going to come back for his church, remember? He snatches the church up, right? And so what happens, remember, he says the dead in Christ shall rise first. So what happens is, is that those of us who are in heaven, when the rapture takes place, and those who are on earth, so what happens is our spirits are reunited with our incorruptible bodies. And then we become just as Jesus is. You know what? We get to appear and disappear in places at will. You know what, Jimmy? You know what happens when, when we get our incorruptible bodies and people are still on the face of the earth? Me and you get to hang out and let's, hey, Jimmy, let's go have lunch in China. And we like, okay. And then we just pop up in China. We have some, some fried rice or whatever we like to eat, Jimmy. And then, you know what, you know, we, then we get to go worship some, right? Then let's say, Jimmy, we decide that we want to go get some Mexican food for dinner. And then, Jimmy, all right. And we just pop up in Mexico, right? And remember, that's what Jesus did, remember? Jesus appeared and disappeared at will to the, the early church, the disciples. Remember, they, they were standing there and they were worshiping, and all of a sudden Jesus just says he just vanished into the clouds. And, you know, that's a benefit that we're going to have. Now, I don't know if it's actually going to work like that, Jimmy, but y'all get the meaning, right? We're going to be as Jesus is. Amen? Amen? Now, in order to be like Jesus is, the first thing you have to do is become a child of God. You have to, in order, you know, hey, I don't know many people that leave an inheritance for people that are not related to them. Now, there are some that do. But I know with the little bit of money that I have left, all $5, I'm going to lead them to my five children. Wait a minute. Oh, 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 oh. Four children. Four children. I was counting Jamila. Hey, I was counting Jamila. 
<laughs> Good thing my wife not in here, huh? <laughs> but, you know, the point is, you know what, whatever possessions I have, I'm going to leave them for my children, right? And so in order to receive the inheritance that God has stored up for us, you have to first be a child of God. How do you do that? By receiving Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. John 3, 16 said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Romans chapter 3, verses 10 and 11 says this. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is no one who seeks after God. Then he goes on to say in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own law toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What that verse means, I love that verse because what it means is that while you are at your very, 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 very worst, Christ died for you. Christ died for you. And, that, and that's something to celebrate if you are a child of God. Romans chapter 6 and verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 10 and 9 and 10 says this, that if you confess, what? With your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Romans 10, 13 states, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be what? Shall be saved. And the rest is up to you. Hard not your heart. Hard not your heart. If you have never received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, this is the best time to do it right now. And I don't have anything to add to it. According to the scriptures, I just read to you, there's nothing that you have to do other than have faith and believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, that you are an unrighteous person, meaning that, you know, you, you, we all sinned. And right now, if you haven't received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you're trying to go by your own righteousness, and, let me, and you're not right with God. To receive the righteousness of Christ means that you are right with God. As a sinner, you are deserving of death. But Jesus Christ came and took that penalty for all of us. And so if that's you, hey, come up after the service, see one of the prayer counselors, see myself. We want to celebrate to you. And let me say, you, you all hear me say this all the time. That was the best decision that I ever made in my life, receiving Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. And it'll be the best decision that you will ever make in your life as well. Amen.